The views expressed and opinions given by the individual hosts and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of ZTalk Radio, its affiliates, or sponsors. Are you sitting comfortably? Then we'll begin. Welcome back to the Paranormal Exchange Radio Show. Now our guests tonight are pretty well known in the paranormal world, um, both from previous shows and their newest show on the Destination America on Sci-Fi Network called Paranormal Lockdown. We have with us Nick Groff and Katrina Weidman, and we'll talk to them about what led them to the show and what goes on in Paranormal Lockdown right after these words. Introducing the Starbucks Flat White. Crafted with two ristretto shots for bolder, caramelly espresso. Whole milk, steamed to a sweet, velvety microphone delicately poured so the espresso rises to the top the perfect union of bold and sweet simplicity is its own artistry so if you have a flat tire dead battery need a tow or lock your keys in the car Geico's emergency roadside assistance is there 24 7 oh dear I got a flat tire hmm. uh, yeah can you find a take where it's a bit more dramatic on that last line yeah yeah I got it right here Someone help me! I have a flat tire! Oh, it's good, good for me. What do you think? Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. You can listen to us anytime, anywhere now. Download our free app now for the iPhone and iPad. Look for the Warren Exchange or House of Mystery app at the Apple App Store today. People are getting attacked and we need help. Whatever is here is pissed. <gasps> oh my god. Almost like something's laying here with me. You okay? I'm losing my mind. It's playing games with us. We're the only two in here now. And something else. And something else. He's a paranormal investigator. I'm on a mission to discover something new in the paranormal field. She's a supernatural expert. We don't really know what's waiting for us. You stay down here by yourself? How long are we talking? They'll spend 72 hours together in the most haunted locations. Nick, are you alright? But are they alone? Tell me you heard that. This house has come alive. I'm not supposed to be here. Paranormal Lockdown.
shadow knows. Now joining us, we have Nick Groff and Katrina Weidman, and uh, they've got a new show out called Paranormal Lockdown, and it's on Destination America, and um, it's on Fridays at 10, 9 Central. Uh, thank you for taking time to talk to us today. Thank you. Thanks Thank for having so us. much for having us. Now, um, how did you guys end up um, getting together? Let's start with Nick. Uh, how did you guys uh, start this? Well, I've been thinking for a long time about how to push the paranormal forward in being at a location longer than just one night could possibly lead to discovering something new in the paranormal field. And now we're immersing ourselves for 72 straight hours at locations that we've been researching for a very long time for certain reasons, like, for instance, the Trans-Allegheny is known for shadow people and different weird anomalies like that. And I just wanted to go back there and try to discover something new that we don't fully understand. Um, so with the concept of that and then meeting up with Katrina, which I think is a very crucial um, way to pursue paranormal investigations from a female perspective and a male perspective, you know, from two different takes and walks of life. And Katrina is just a, an amazing uh, person in general and very passionate about the paranormal. And I felt we just made a great team. You know, when you meet somebody in life and it just it just works and you have that great bond, it's kind of like she was my long lost sister that I've been looking for. <laughs> so it just worked out and <laughs> here we are. Oh, fantastic. And Katrina, uh, um, what were you doing at the time when this came along? Um, I was actually um, jumping off of another project. So uh, this actually came like at the most terrific time that I could ever think of. And, um, you know, it's like what Nick said. Um, it was like our very first conversation. It was like, I remember getting off the phone. I was like, he feels like I've known him my entire life. Um and it just, you know, to echo Nick's words again, it was just, uh, it just felt right, you know, that this was the right project, these were the right people to work with. And, um, you know, definitely couldn't be happier with that decision. Now, Katrina, what what would you be doing if you weren't doing this? Uh, well, I mean, if in the paranormal, I would always be doing the paranormal. Um, I always tell people, like, regardless if there's a camera or not, um, this is something that, I've had in my life since I was a little kid um, and, you know, when it changed if there was a TV show involved or not. Um, so I, I would definitely still be involved in the paranormal and um, film and television, you know, that's what I went to school with. So uh, for school four, excuse me. So I would, I would definitely still be working in that field. Um, and if for some reason I said, screw all of that, I'd go to law school. <laughs> and Nick, what about yourself? I've always been interested in the paranormal. I think I'd still probably be thinking about different theories on life and just a different quest, I believe. Uh, personally, I've been looking for things since I've been a little kid about all things unknown, and I'm very fascinated by that. And I don't know why. Maybe it was from my grandmother talking to me when I was at a young age about, you know, UFOs and aliens and all sorts of interesting topics like that, but also talking about ghosts and paranormal things. So maybe I'd still be pursuing that field, um, but also I'm, I'm a film fanatic. I love movies and I love just uh, documentaries and stuff like that. So I'd probably be maybe just telling stories still about um, about things in this world that I guess have a psychological twist on it. And I think that's the type of things that fascinates me and kind of makes my brain work a little bit. What what are they what are they going to see when people watch your show? What what's kind of the format of it? Well, it's 72 hours, so we're actually confined to the locations for 72 straight hours, three days, and we're living there, we're eating there, we're sleeping there, we don't leave, Katrina and myself, and we're investigating nonstop during the day, during the night, um, pretty much every single hour except when we have to rest about, you know, an hour or so at um, some specific time at night. It could be 6 in the morning, it could be nonstop where we just don't sleep for that, that third that third day, or it could, it could be just our, our downtime where, you know, sometimes things aren't just always happening constantly. So it's 
very interesting and fascinating by what we're actually gathering and learning and getting new um, information as we're pursuing the research that we're doing at these locations. And um, we're just discovering that when we become at our most vulnerable state, that we're finding new things uh, in the paranormal field. How many people are, are there with you at the time when you're in lockdown? When we do our nighttime investigations, it's uh, me, Nick, and Rob. And then um, at some point, you know, when it gets, I guess, like, uh, we get up to, I don't know what, Nick, like, hour 22 of being awake, you know, Rob Rob goes back to his hotel and rests up, and uh, then it's just me and Nick sleeping there. So how do you how do you find that? Now, have you... Have you has it been kind of a, a challenge of, of doing that long at a time, like 72 hours? Yeah, it's been extremely exhausting. Um, we find our body starting to break down physically, mentally. There's a whole psychology behind it, too, that I'm really fascinated about where, you know, when you get to a certain point, when you're over 24 hours uh, nonstop investigating and just being in these locations that are very gritty, and plus the environmental elements are kind of against you at times where it could be freezing or it could just be filthy and dirty. And those are, those are the, the moments where you have to push your body through um, to keep pursuing to discover something new that where some people just won't go and won't go that extensive amount of time. So we learned that eventually we do have to let our bodies rest which then will isolate ourselves, and everybody leaves the whole entire building. So Rob Safi is a camera operator. He films us on a high-definition high camera that films in 6K, um, and he documents us for the most part, but then he'll leave, and it's just Katrina and I in this sometimes massive places that are just gigantic, and then we'll separate for a little while, and we'll go to sleep, and whatever happens during our sleep, our cameras will document it, and sometimes it's it's startling. Um, especially when you're vulnerable. So, Katrina, when you're awake for that long of a period, can you really trust uh, what you're seeing, what you're perceiving, your um, the, the feelings you get? Yeah, can you trust it? Absolutely, and I think that's a great question, and that's something I would ask too, and that's something I absolutely think about when we do this. Um, what's interesting to me, though, is that, you know, when we're doing these investigations and we are pushing ourselves physically, um, I'm, you know, we have subjective experiences, and I think those are open to, well, they're tired. You know, they've been up for a while, so are they really seeing what they're seeing? Are they really feeling what they're see feeling? But what's interesting to me about it is that when we have those experiences, we've been able to back it up with evidence, like visual evidence. Or um, the episode that happened uh, this past Friday, our cameraman had physical evidence where he had bite marks on his back and scratch marks. So, you know, at that point you have to you have to wonder, is there something to the fact that we're making ourselves more vulnerable? And um, in the years I've been doing this, I, I've done a lot of client work. And that's something I've noticed with my clients is that, you know, the more vulnerable they were for whatever reason, wh whether that was real world issues or they were just so stressed out from the paranormal activity happening in their homes, the more activity they had. You know, so you have to wonder, do these things feed off of that vulnerability? How do you select the places that you're going to do? Um, so when you get to them, the locations, is it something you two have worked out or is it something that's done for you? Uh, no, I, I, we've been researching locations for years, like this episode coming up on Friday. Uh, Franklin Castle in Cleveland, Ohio, I've been looking at that location for 15 years. So it's taken us 15 years to finally gain access to it, and the owner was really, really nice to give us the privilege to go on as a team, Katrina and myself, uh, to investigate it fully um, for those 72 hours. And Franklin Castle is just, it has so much history. You know, built in 1880, uh, Tiedemann was um, this prestigious uh, individual in the area, and I felt that this location had so much history. It's labeled as one of the top ten most haunted locations in all of America. But what's interesting is it hasn't fully been totally investigated like we're doing it. So that's what I found fascinating for the last 15 years. What is all the legends, the myths, the buildup, the hype of this location? We know the facts and the history and trying to separate the legends from the facts. 
because that's what we I feel we do a really really good job on. So um, our team, you know, really researches it uh, from top to bottom before we even go into these locations. So we know kind of what is and what isn't, and then. You know, we try to discover new things along uh, our journey, too, and sometimes being at the locations, we'll learn something new or talking to the owners or an eyewitness account. Um, you just discover new things about the land in general, maybe not just about the house. It could be the land that now this foundation or this property sits on. So it, it's interesting. I mean, with what we're doing and all the research that goes into it, and then we're there, and then it just feels like a roller coaster ride for those three days. Finding out that information, but does that kind of um, preset you for what's going to happen? Like, if you know some of the events that have happened in that location, do, could, couldn't that kind of put you on on notice of something? I, I think so. Yeah, I think that's a valid point to make. Um, like, you know, are we going to be? Uh, you know, maybe some people would think we would like create those experiences based off of what we know. Um, but I think what's different about uh, myself and Nick is that, you know, we've been doing this for so long that we've, you know, once you've been doing something for so long, like 10 years, 15 years, like me and Nick, you get very good at separating that. Um, and what, again, I go back to, you know, we do know these things, we do do our research because it helps our investigations, but again, we're getting physical evidence of this stuff. Um, for example, the Anderson Hotel which was our episode this past Friday, um, you know, we we did our research about this place. We knew what was going on. We knew that there had been physical attacks. Um, now, Nick and I didn't get physically attacked, um, but our cameraman did. So, you know, even though we had, you know, knowledge of that stuff happening, it didn't happen to us, it happened to somebody else. Um, take Trans Allegheny, for example. Um, for, you know, decades, people have been reporting this kind of, um, this figure that they call the creeper. Now, you know, Nick and I were, were there. To, we wanted to see what kind of evidence we could get, and we had knowledge that people see this thing called a creeper, um, but we didn't see it with our own eyes. Our camera caught it. So um, I think that's kind of the best, you know, rebuttal I can give to that is that, you know, we're actually capturing these things so, on uh, film. Yeah. Audio and, and, I, and I think it's interesting too, like what Katrina saying, because we're very logical thinkers. Like we know how to separate the two uh, from hearing people talk about, it, from researching it. We really go in with an open mind, to be honest with you. Um, Katrina and I just kind of forget about some of those things, and we go in for the experience. You know, what is our body going to put ourselves through when we're in our most vulnerable state? And we are learning new things, which I find fascinating. Like we didn't actually know the Jane Doe's and the, the John Doe's at the Anderson Hotel, like Katrina was talking about, where a cameraman got attacked. We didn't know individual uh, people that once lived there because it was kind of a flop house. So people came and, and, and went, and some people never left that location. So it's very interesting. Um, I mean, we theorize all the time about any possibility, and you kind of have to. You have to be logical. You have to be well-balanced and grounded. You have to sometimes be positive and not let the negative overrule you. And also, you have to look at everything. You can't be one-sided and just say, all of this is, is not happening. Because then it doesn't, it doesn't make sense for what we're doing. Because at the end of the day, we're not out to prove or disprove this exists or any of that stuff. We're, try to, we're trying to discover something new that we don't fully understand that it, it kind of evolves in this reality and this in this environment that we live in. And I think that's the main objective for us is to document and try to discover something new that we don't have a name for it yet. And what, what kind of an attack did your cameraman face? Yeah, he had um, these weird um, teeth marks that showed up on his back. He, he felt like he told us after, because we went in great detail, we talked for a while after, and it shook him up really bad. Um, still this day, I talked to him about it. And what's interesting about Rob is he's very skeptical, too. So he hasn't been around, and he wasn't going, like, week after week investigating locations like we have for the last, you know, years. So it's interesting because his, his perspective is be looking at the camera, making sure we're in focus, making sure he's recording and documenting us. 
and that's pretty much that. And those cameras are really um, crucial for our investigations because of the high resolution, the dynamics of light that we're filming in, plus IR, because that has never been done before uh, in an investigation. So we're really pushing the boundaries. And when he was in that moment, he kept saying he was hearing shuffling coming from these rooms around us. And what was interesting is the, the night before, I was hearing shuffling, too, when I was sleeping in that room uh, right next to me where that hallway where I slept. And then suddenly he just, we're in darkness, so Katrina and I kind of jumped when he let out his um, painful yell that he did. And then when we pulled up his shirt and on the back, you know, he had, he had some bite marks and some scratches like Katrina was describing. So now, Kat- Katrina, I was going to say, uh, the years that you've put into this and you're going through, uh, uh, does it still change you every time you go to a new location and do a new investigation? Do you come out of it different? Yeah, I think it depends on the location itself and, the you know, if I'm working with clients. Um, I, I think if I'm working with clients, I would say every time you're a little changed because, um Client cases, for the most part, you know, they're very, they're highly emotional because your clients are emotional about what's going on. And, um, you know, you have to practice kind of that, uh, that wall of um, separating yourself and not getting too close. Um, and sometimes that's hard for me because I just want to, you know, you want to be there for someone when you see somebody hurting, you want to you wanna fix it for them. Um, when we do these locations, these bigger locations, I think it depends on the history and the things that we've experienced ourselves. So, for example, um, Trans Allegheny, um, that was a really big uh, earth-shattering place for me, I would say, because, um, you know, I, I mean, it has a very sad history. Obviously, you know, there was there were a lot of... Um, mistakes made along the way with the with the mental health system there. And um, people suffered and paid the price for that, which is horrible. And, you know, I don't know how you can go into a place like that and not be changed afterwards. Um, just on a human level. On the paranormal level, um, you know, what was so fascinating to me is the visual evidence we got because I've never seen that. I've never seen that kind of visual evidence before. And I've never seen anything like that with my own eyes. Um, and just the feelings that Nick and I were having, although subjective, they were very powerful. And then we kept having things like our batteries dying um, when they were brand new. And, you know, kind of all the typical things you hear in a paranormal investigation, like, oh, I'm feeling anxiety. I, I think I just saw something out the corner of my eye. Our batteries just died. I'm, I'm feeling cold. Those things that um, are more on the subjective side then were backed up by the fact that we got this figure on film and you know that was really a an eye-opener for me because it made me think of every single investigation I've ever been on where those things have happened and we kind of discounted them you know and then it also made me think that you know we have these amazing cameras that we're using and it was able to capture this thing and it made me think you know are the reasons that the field's kind of been stunted, at least with visual evidence, because we just haven't had the right equipment. We haven't had the right technology to detect this stuff. And now that we do and technology is advancing, you know, where is that going to bring the field? And that that brings me to Nick. Now, you're a tech guy. So how is it that you select which kind of um, equipment you're going to use in these investigations? Like, uh, it seems like there's always new items coming out and... Uh, uh, new equipment. Uh, how do you know what it's doing and and what it's going to do for you? Right, and that's where I think we have to be open minded. And I'm all about trying something once, uh, if it makes sense to my mind. <laughs> you know, from a skeptical standpoint, I have to like, I have to see it, I have to understand it, I have to know what it's actually calculating or doing, especially when you're dealing with environments. Um, you know, if we go back ten years, you're looking at EMF detectors, electromagnetic fields, and then we started dissecting, like, the environments. And then sometimes I think, you know, what the most important thing is is to use basic equipment and just document. I think sometimes if we just document and take some of those objects and physical items out of our hands, 
I think those are experiences that you can focus in on more, you know, what you're seeing with your own eyes, what your body is sensing. And, yes, it's nice to back it up with, you know, um, physical evidence of, like, an EMF detector of electromagnetic spike in the environment. But then it's like you have to go into different circumstances. You know, is there electricity? What are we looking at? So I think sometimes we get so focused on certain things like that and we forget about just the environment you're in and to document so uh, I like basic things. I, I like a, a simple uh, digital recorder, um, which is nice. And I think even that I'm trying to move away from because I'm looking at different types of things that we can actually develop and work towards more on, like, um, different sound variables, you know, rather than just the frequency that we're capturing with our digital recorders. Can we go below, you know, negative 20 in frequencies and also get into... Um, different spectrums of light and sound. Um, so that's what we're really looking at now as we're starting to advance a little bit moving forward in different locations we're investigating and try different things because the tough thing about the unexplainable and non-known is we, we don't fully understand it yet. So I think we have to use certain things and try different things to see if we can possibly document stuff. But what I do know is the camera we're using now have been absolutely amazing. In all my years of doing this, I started off when I was using mini DV tapes, and that was interesting. And then we moved to just simple um, uh, skin discs, you know, to um, uh, record to. And then now we're up to the part where we're shooting in 6K, the highest resolution possible to date for technology with a camera that we can film on that sees, and we learned how to take the IR sensor off of it, so now we're actually shooting in all dynamics of light plus infrared with an uh, infrared light panel to um, see in the darkness. So it's very fascinating what we're actually documenting with these new cameras and technology as we're moving forward. And so, you know, you're, you said you're skeptical. Um, does that mean you're skeptical as in you think that there is afterlife and ghosts or not at all? I, I believe there is. I really do, because I've had experiences with my own eyes um, where I saw a solid figure staying two feet in front of me, my face, and it was a lady with an old hospital gown she was wearing, and I will never forget that moment. And I always thought, how could that be possible in the environment to have enough energy, immense amount of energy to manifest some, somebody that was not supposed to be there, that she saw me, I saw her in that moment, you know, kind of pushed my envelope a little bit and vividly implanted the seed in my head of life after death and what's beyond. And I know it's possible. I mean, we're really pushing forward as a human race to discover something new. I mean, look at the scientists going to different planets and universes and looking at wormholes that, you know, now stretch based off of Einstein's theories and stuff. Just very interesting uh, subject matter, matter as we move forward, and I believe in electricity. We, we consume food that turns into electricity within our bones, and as human beings, you know, we're all going to die. That's a fact. But what happens after that electricity is released from the body, especially in dramatic deaths or suicides, or something that's so immense at a location that could just have this rapid fire, fire impulse into the environment that maybe it this energy and this electricity holds at these locations, and maybe that's what we're communicating with, vibrational waves or ultrasound or electricity, something that an environment holds uh, specifically from energies from individuals that are left behind, you know, residual intelligence. But what I don't understand is sometimes we're capturing voices on our recorders that is in direct intelligent response to our questions, especially in our names. And that's, that's one thing I find very interesting is how can we be in complete silence and Katrina and I are asking questions that we get our names in response to us. So then we get into different theories. So I'm not skeptical. I'm very logical, I guess is the best word, but I'm skeptical about some, some equipment because I don't, sometimes I don't know how it's, they, manufactured them or by individuals, and I don't know how they actually kind of conduct them based off of um, giving giving readings specifically for paranormal activity, you know what I mean? So I'm more interested in, like, I get heart facts sometimes, you know, 
you, you see what you get on your camera, and that's what you're getting, like straight up just hard facts, uh, because I feel like that's what we need sometimes to push us forward. And Katrina, how, how is it for you? Like, which side do I lie on? Yeah, it's, um, I, I mean, I definitely believe that there is something that um, is happening as far as, you know, what are these paranormal experiences? Um, and, you know, I think we have to remember that the paranormal encompasses so many things, not just ghosts and spirits. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm definitely an open believer to all these things. Um, but, you know, like Nick said, you have to you have to remain skeptical, especially, and, you know, Nick and I remain very logical when we go into these places because, you know, we, we don't know what these things are. And that's what I think is so fascinating is that, you know, for, for centuries people have been having these experiences. I mean, regardless of religion, regardless of what part of the world you're from, um, people have had these experiences. And, you know, some of them can be explained away, I'm sure. Um, and I've seen that in my work, that sometimes, you know, things, um, you can use the word debunk, but uh, sometimes there's natural explanations for things. But there's a lot of things that there isn't an explanation for. So, you know, what is that? Is that a ghost like we've defined it? Is it, um, you know, something completely different that we haven't even thought of yet? Um, and I'm where I'm at with it is I, I think there's a whole spectrum of, uh, you know, kind of these these entities. I think there's a whole spectrum of them. And I think, you know, maybe some of them are ghosts, as in, you know, it's your grandfather who was once living and came back for whatever reason. And I think some other things are, you know, um, you know, yet to be determined as to what they are. And so coming up on the new episode coming on Friday, Katrina, what was, what was the most, let's say, um, terrifying thing? You know, the episode on Friday, I, I want to say that location was terrifying. I think that location is fascinating because um, we, I always find it fascinating when there's group experiences as far as multiple witnesses to a paranormal event. And uh, we talked to two people that lived in the house, the location that we went to, and when they were children, um, they used to interact with this spirit, this ghost of a little girl. And they both had these experiences. And um, I find that really fascinating. And what's interesting about this place, too, is that um, we do have visual evidence of something. So, again, I go back to, you know, we're using these amazing cameras. And, you know, now that, you know, technology is kind of catching up to what we do, um, I mean, that's very exciting to me. And, and Nick, what about you for the upcoming episode? Yeah, I, I thought it was a, a beautiful location, number one. And um, I could understand if the living was there and then passed on, what you know, the Tiedemann family, if they do haunt the location or the children that passed on there, then I could understand why they possibly would want to still be there as ghostly imprints or images of uh, once living and because it is an amazing location, like Katrina is saying, and it's very fascinating. It's rich in history. It's um, it's built magnificently. So I, I think that location is just one of a kind, and that's what fascinates us sometimes is just the history of a location and what possibly could be lingering inside. Um, so there was moments where we get startled because we unexpectedly have stuff happen to us like, there's a moment where I'm in the basement and I'm walking and Katrina and I are talking about trying to speak with uh, the ghost of a little girl who has been seen here. And suddenly I get, I get touched on the back of my leg. Like a hand comes back, uh, across the back of my leg and just gets touched. And I'm like, whoa, what was that? Because I wasn't expecting it in the dark. And then we realized that possibly we're communicating with a little girl down there um, that everybody's been talking about for the generations of uh, living there and, and whatnot. So... I thought it was exactly what Katrina saying, fascinating. Um, and we, I think we feel that we discovered something new at the location and we separated the legends, all these legends to build it up to be just this horrific location and a bad location from kind of the negative talk that a, a typical location that looks haunted on the outside. You know, if you walked by on the street, you'd be like, whoa, that place is 
extremely haunted just by looking at it. That's what people say. But you really don't know because you have an investigator. You haven't been stepped foot in it. You just make, you're judging a book by its cover, you know? Uh, but I, I think when Katrina and I got inside and really engaged the location and slept there and became a part of it, and we noticed that the spirits started becoming more comfortable with us because we felt we were dealing with spirits um, just by the responses we were getting and um, the documentation. And um, we captured something really cool, too, on camera, which I thought was really interesting. What, what was it that – can you talk about it or <laughs> – <laughs> I'll give it away if we talk about it. Yeah. But it was something. It was something that I, I I haven't seen, and I think why we're capturing stuff on these on uh, Rob's camera, the high definition 6K camera, is because now we're shooting in higher resolution. In my past, I've been shooting on night vision cameras that don't specifically um, see that clear because it's one sided. You're seeing just infrared. You know the green green tint or the black and white um, tint that you get when you just shoot in infrared. With this, you're seeing in all colors, all aspects, all, res all uh, dynamics of light, plus the infrared. So we're, we're starting to capture new things that uh, it's at the clearest possible resolution that is, is interesting. I mean, it's blowing Katrina and I away from doing this for however long we've been doing this. And what's cool about us is we don't know everything. I, you know, that we're learning, just like everybody else in this world. We're learning about these things as we evolve. And Katrina, our... Katrina and myself aren't out saying, you know, we know everything, and this is what it is, because that's not the truth. We don't know everything. That's why we're pursuing this. That's why we're passionate, and that's why we're really excited in these moments. But we're also calm and collective, because we want to try to figure it out at the same time. And, and how does it work? Like, when you've got a place like Hinsdale House, and you've got a guest like Lorraine Warren, um, how does that affect what you do? And that's on two different levels. One is because she's, she is a psychic and a medium, and, and the other is just that she is a celebrity and, and, and well-known. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really know if it affected us in any like negative way. I think the best thing about Lorraine is that, um, you know, uh, she's been doing this for decades, and I think in a lot of ways, the style of her work that um, she and Ed uh, did for so many years is really kind of shaped how modern investigations go. Um, so I think we learned more from Lorraine, um, especially because we found out that, um, and we didn't know this until we talked to her, but she was there in the 70s at that location, and she had investigated it. Um, so I think that was really helpful to what we were doing. Um, and it just sort of gives a timeline to the fact that, you know, these things at the Hinsdale House have been going on for generations. Um, but, you know, Lorraine's very professional, and I've worked with Lorraine for the last 10 years. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I don't think that, like, really phased us that it's, you know, Lorraine Warren because um, we've had time to get to know her. But also from a medium point of view, uh, do you, do you mm -hmm. have a belief in, in psychic mediums? Um, me personally, I mean, uh, you know, I know Nick's worked with them, I've worked with them, and I think they can be helpful. Um, I've also seen them be not so helpful, but I think that really depends on, you know, you have to use your best judgment. Um, you have to definitely bring in a psychic medium that you trust. You know, um, I prefer to bring them in, um, like if I'm working with clients especially, I, I don't have them meet the clients um, because I haven't found that to be helpful. Um, and, you know, you have to really take what they say with a grain of salt. You can't take it as gospel, but, you know, you can definitely use the information they give you to see if it helps you get better results. Right. Just another tool in the uh, in your armor, so to speak. Right. Where do you see yourself going with this series coming? Um, uh, do, you, do you plan on um, doing a lot more episodes of this? Yes, absolutely. We would love to uh, have the opportunity to keep pursuing different locations. I mean, we pick particular locations for reasons, and everything has a reason for why we do what we do. Um, like we were talking about, we bring guests in because we need we need the help to pursue something that we're investigating, or the location in particular for what we want to research a little bit further in the paranormal field and try to discover something new. So as long as we can have the opportunity to keep moving forward and keep pursuing it and passionately seeking out, um, you know, 
something new that we can discover as human beings to say, okay, this is possibly what this is made up of. Or maybe, who knows, maybe we discover the holy grail of what possibly happens when the body gives up and we pass on. Where does that energy go? Is there some sort of life after death? Is there um, something new that we just don't fully understand yet? And these are all the questions we talk about every day, uh, Katrina and I. And we theorize heavily. So we're we're always seeking um, new clues, I guess you could say, to trying to discover some sort of new information that would help us in our quest. And what do you find your biggest influences have been up to now? And I'll start with Nick. I think my grandmother. My, she was a big influence in my life when I was a kid. And, you know, I used to talk to her all the time about certain things. Um, paranormal, spiritual, um, religion, just everything. And she was open-minded. And I think that's what I liked about her is just talking about different things. And it wasn't just closed book. That's it. One side. This is the only thing that happens. Done. And I think we're all on our, our own separate quest in our life. You know, some positive, some negative. And I think you have to stay on that path that you were kind of paved the way to go on. And sometimes we all fall off that path a little bit. So, we have our own separate quest, but our, our paths all cross for certain reasons. We're all interconnected in this world. And we get into conversations like this one right now, and we start talking about life, death, certain things, or where you're going in your life, or it could be anything, any walks of life. And I think that's what I find more fascinating than anything, and that's kind of where my grandmother started me off as a young child, and now here I am as an adult thinking about these things even more so than ever. And it just keeps evolving my own brain. Um, and I think it's, honestly, it's making me smarter because I was really immature back when I was younger. I didn't fully understand. I was that young, you know, young kid going into locations that looked awesome from the outside and we had access. And I was like, all right, what can we say here? Just like going in nonchalant, just looking for, you know, different things to try to document. But now I feel like, totally different ballpark that we're in um, where we can remain who we are, how we are, and go in with a respectful manner, just like you would walk into anyone's house, and try to seek that out. And that's that's what my grandmother always talk, uh, taught me. You know, go in, be who you are, always maintain that, be passionate for what you do, and love in life, be happy, and be respectful. And Katrina, who's your uh, influence? You know, it's funny, Nick, I swear our grandmothers must have been long lost sisters or something. Um, because, Probably. and that's my answer too, you know, my grandmother. Um, and it, like very much, honestly, they sound like twins. Um, my grandmother was the same way, just a very open, very wise person, very kind person. And, um, you know, she always had paranormal experiences. I was like one of the first ghost stories I heard as a kid. She used to live in this beautiful old farmhouse that she renovated. Um, that I think the kitchen dated back to, like, 1690, and the rest of the house was early 1700s and um, had underground uh, tunnels that went to the house across the street, and um, George Washington um, and his troops uh, stayed next door during the war, and um, some historians have told us that possibly they stayed at her house. So she had a lot of paranormal activity at her house, and... um, you know, she was very much open to that stuff. And, you know, um, she's, I, I mean, in the paranormal, I would say, I think she's definitely someone who taught me that it was okay to believe this stuff, that it was okay to explore it. Um, and just as a person in general, I would say, like, just in my life, in all aspects, I think she's probably um, the greatest influence I've had. And so now, um, uh, what's the uh, website and uh, location, or do you have any sort of place that people can go to check out the show? Pretty much, if you go on Facebook, search Paranormal Lockdown, that's our Facebook page. Everybody's going there right now. And Katrina and myself, we both have, we're all over social media. Um, but DestinationAmerica.com, Paranormal Lockdown, it's on every Friday, 10 p.m. Eastern Time, 9 Central. All new episodes every Friday through April, uh, March, and then into April. Well, fantastic. Well, thank you very much for talking about this. This has uh, been a, a, a very learning. Um, thank you uh, for joining me. Yeah, thank, oh, thank you. Thank you so much for having us on. The mission has
has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you! This has been a production of the Z-Talk Radio Network. If you're lying to me, I'll be back. <laughs>